We are delighted and we'd like to welcome you as well. We're very excited to hear what you have to say tonight. I, of course, heard of it a long time ago. I'm very interested in what's been happening with it. So we have two people, two presenters here tonight. One is Rick Gillespie, and he is the executive director of TIGER, the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, a nonprofit foundation based in the US. TIGER is best known for its investigation of Amelia Earhart disappearance. But Rick has been chasing the white bird since 1984. He learned the legend of the plane in the Gull Pond, which is out around Patrick's Cove area, in 1992, and led several searches of the pond in 1993 and 94, but results were inconclusive. This evening, Rick will bring us up to date on the investigation and Tiger's plans for a new search in September. That's exciting news. And our second presenter here tonight is Dr. Lisa Daly. She is the chair of Heritage NL, a board member for Newfoundland and Labrador Historical Society and the Conception Bay Museum. She has been working in Heritage since 2001 in many ways from tour guide to museum manager. She holds a PhD in archaeology and has specialized in aviation archaeology mostly researching pre-confederation sites, such as Second World War sites in Gander, Stephenville, and Goose Bay, and doing research for flights in the 1920s and 30s with the Conception Bay Museum. She also writes fiction and plans to have a book written, uh, co-written by the late Nelson Sharon out next year. So congratulations on that. And without further ado, I'll pass the floor over to you. Let's go back to 1927. There's a prize put up by a hotel owner who had hotels in New York and Paris, Raymond Ortigue. At, he put up $25,000 for the first nonstop flight between New York and Paris. Now, as you probably all know, the Atlantic had been flown before from here, from Harbor Grace, by Alcock and Brown in 1919. But no one had ever flown between the two major world cities, New York and Paris. And the prize was for the first flight, nonstop, in either direction. Didn't matter. Well, everybody wanted this. And the biggest names in aviation were competing for it. Uh, Richard Byrd, who was the first to fly over the North Pole and the South Pole, was uh, competing for it. He had a big three-engined airplane. but on uh, a practice takeoff with a full fuel load. The airplane flipped over on takeoff, wrecked the airplane. Nobody was hurt seriously, but he was out of the running. A French ace, the highest scoring French ace of World War I, René Falk, was working with Igor Sikorsky with another big three-engine plane. And they were doing a full fuel takeoff from Long Island uh, as a practice run but they ran off the end of the runway, the landing gear collapsed, the airplane crashed, and it caught fire, and uh, Funk got out okay, but two of his crew were killed in the fire. Uh, Davis and Wooster, another pair with a big three-engine airplane, they were in Virginia, they were doing a full fuel takeoff, ran off the end of the runway, this time the airplane nosed into a, a marshy area, a bog, and they were drowned. So planes were crashing, people were dying all over the place. When two famous French flyers, Charles Nugesser and Francois Colli, announced that they were gonna try to make the flight from the other direction, Paris to New York. Now that's against the prevailing wind. They're going the wrong way. But Colli, the navigator, had a plan. He knew that low pressure areas, typically over the North Atlantic, always rotate counterclockwise. So if they, if they picked a day with a big low pressure area and went north and rode the top of it, they would actually get tailwinds coming across. And so the plan was to take off from Paris and go up through a, and hit North America right up at the tip of Newfoundland, uh, right at the, the top of the island. That was the plan, and from there on down to New York. Well, these guys were really famous, and uh, 
they didn't try to make a full fuel takeoff. They made test flights in their airplane, but they didn't try the thing that had killed everybody else. Their airplane was a giant white biplane that was a modification of a French naval aircraft that was designed so that you could jettison the landing gear on takeoff. This was the days before retractable landing gear. You could jettison the landing gear, cut it loose, and land in the water. The hull was boat shaped. Now you couldn't take off again, you couldn't even taxi in the water, but at least if you, it was a naval aircraft operating off an aircraft carrier, so if you got caught out away from the aircraft carrier and had to land at sea, you could save the crew and save the airplane. The ship would just come and pick you up and hoist you back aboard. Well, Nugisera and Coley figured that this would be a good plane to modify for a transatlantic flight because they could just drop the landing gear and not have to carry the landing gear across the, the ocean. And uh, they could just fill the plane with enough gas to make New York and then land in New York Harbor beside the Statue of Liberty, a French gift to the United States. Great plan. Well, one of the competitors, kind of the dark horse competitor for the $25,000 prize, was an airmail pilot named Charles Lindbergh. Nobody took him seriously. He was test flying an airplane he had, had built with some backers from St. Louis, Missouri, so they called it the Spirit of St. Louis. And he was in San Diego, California, on the other end of the U.S., doing test flying in the spirit of St. Louis, when news arrived on May 8th, 1927, that Nunjasar and Coley had succeeded in taking off for New York with a full load of fuel, 40 hours of gas, enough to make it. Well, okay, that's the first time an airplane with enough gas to make the flight had succeeded in getting off the ground, and this was Nunjasar and Coley. I mean, these guys are gonna make it. And Lindbergh's reaction to that was, I'm going to have to do something else with this airplane because they're going to win the prize. And so he kind of gave up until the next day when they didn't show up in New York. It was, a, it was the weather was not unlike it was is here today in New York. And, uh, but it was an unjustice. You know, he'll make it okay, but he never, he never arrived. But they were so sure he would that a French journalist in New York, wanting to scoop the competition, wired a complete account of their arrival back to Paris. Well, Paris went crazy. You know, the airplanes were circling the Eiffel Tower, and Nunjasar has, has arrived. But eventually they had to, like, no, they didn't arrive, and nobody knows where they were. And everybody, there's this massive search. They, You'll read about how big the search for Amelia Earhart was in 1937. This search was bigger, involving more countries, more ships, nothing found. But there were witness accounts, mostly from right here on the Avalon. And they told, and this is like 16 different people in different locations, starting up at Bakalu Island, down through Harbor Grace, down through uh, Brigus, uh, Ocean Pond, down to St. Mary's, and then the people at St. Mary's saw an airplane headed west across St. Mary's Bay, apparently on fire, in distress. Now, we don't know if it was really on fire or whether they were seeing clouds of steam from a failed coolant system. It was a liquid-cooled engine, and, and if there was a failure in that system, it would be trailing a big plume of white steam that people might, thought, might have thought were smoke. But they saw it long enough so that they lost sight of it about Redhead, which is a terrain feature you may or may not know, along the, the, the western shore of the Cape Shore. And that, that's where the trail ends with documented evidence. And these are affidavits that people swore to before magistrates at the time, and they still exist in the archives down at the rooms in, in St. John's. Well, why did people swear affidavits before magistrates? Because it's Newfoundland in 1927, and the Irish residents know 
that the English residents are not going to believe anything they say unless it's sworn before a magistrate. So they go and they swear before a magistrate, and so we have this written record. Okay, that's good hard evidence for an historical investigator like me. But then we have the story picks up down on the Cape Shore with old stories about people who saw what they took to be airplane wreckage on the little rocky island in the middle of Gull Pond. Uh, we don't know exactly what they saw, but it was material that, that they concluded that the only way this could get here is if a plane crashed. So there must be a plane in the pond. And the story got started. There's a plane in, in Gull Pond. Now, the story got started, but it didn't go very far. This was primarily just a, a curiosity people talked about in Patrick's Cove, uh, Gooseberry, when there were still people living in Gooseberry, uh, and right in that local area. And uh, I, I'll go through the names of the people who said that they saw wreckage, and in some cases recovered wreckage, and what they said they recovered. And I'm, I'm going uh, to do this on the off chance that anybody knows or is related to these people. Almost all, well, they're all dead now. But I have to tell you, the first one on the list is a man named Nicholas McGraw, who uh, was, uh, he, he was trapping muskrat on the Branch River. On, he said it was a morning in May and it was either a Sunday or a Monday. Well, it turns out that May 9th was a Monday, for what that's worth. And he heard three rapid explosions, unexplained, off in the distance. Uh, boom, boom, boom. And he couldn't imagine what that was. And then the next winter, he was hunting caribou and he went out across the ice on Gull Pond and saw pieces of lightweight sheet metal painted blue scattered around. He said, well, that something blew up here and it must have been an airplane because what else could it possibly be? And uh, he was one of the first to start talking about, well, there must be a plane in the pond. Well, I was telling this story about Nicholas McGraw to Evan Kareen, who writes for the Telegram newspaper. And I, I told him in this story, he says, yeah, Nicholas McGraw, uh, I'm from Bratch. He was my great, great uncle. <laughs> so, okay. You know, that, that's what I love about this. You know, the, people know people and there are related people that are involved in this. So I'll, I'll go through some of these names on the chance that anybody here knows more. Uh, there was Anthony McGraw who uh, in the winter of 1940, he was 27 at the time, he was hunting caribou in the company of Ronald McGraw, who was only 14, and they saw a five foot tall piece of metal sticking out of the ice in the northwest part of the island in the Gull Pond. The metal was lightweight, riveted, painted robin's egg blue on both sides, and was attached to wood framing. And that's important because that's, the white bird was basically a wood and fabric airplane with uh, wood framing, but it had uh, sheet metal fuel tanks, three big sheet metal fuel tanks between the cockpit and the engine. And, uh, and, and we know those tanks were painted, but we don't know what color they were painted. They might have been blue. So it's an interesting story. Uh, but these guys twisted the metal back and forth until it broke free. But they were loaded down with caribou meat and couldn't take the metal back home to Patrick's Cove. So they stashed the pieces in a stand of tuck. Tuckamore, you all know what Tuckamore is. Near the southwest end of the Gull Pond. When Anthony went back to retrieve it, he couldn't find it. And he, he thought, one of his neighbors, Patsy Judge from Gooseberry, had probably gotten in there first and taken it. So it goes back and forth. 
Um, Anthony McGraw was apparently unaware of Nicholas McGraw's story and later claimed to have been the first person to see pieces of the plane in the pond. And the people are fighting back and, no, I was the first one to see it. No, I was the first one to see it. And that's how these things go. So, so we have Anthony McGraw, right? He was with Ronald McGraw, who uh, later talked about it. John McGraw was the older brother of Anthony McGraw. Are you keeping this all straight now? And uh, he was born in 1900. He had a piece of the plane, very light metal, 18 or 20 inches long, and which was torn apart as if it had been in an explosion or had hit something very hard. He doesn't mention any paint or exactly where he, he found it. Now, in 1969, John McGraw, the guy we're talking about here, did an interview with a journalist named Jack Fitzgerald and was telling me he was the first person to uh, see the wreckage. And he, he pieced things together from um, research that he had done in 1969 and decided that this airplane in the pond must have been the white bird. That's the first time anybody, we have a record of anybody thinking the plane in the pond was the white bird. Remember, 1927, then the story gets started in the 30s and the 40s, but it's just a plane in the pond. It's a curiosity. And then one of the guys tells a journalist that it's the plane in the pond, and suddenly there's a, a October 26, 1969 issue of the Newfoundland Herald carried a banner headline, A Key to World Aviation History Lies Buried Near Patrick's Cove. Well, boy, they're off and running when that hit. Now it's just not a plane, it's the white bird. Now, the evidence that John McGraw cited for thinking it was the white bird is not very correct. <laughs> I don't know where he got his information, but it's not. But the point is that there is really good evidence that it was probably the white bird. He reached the right conclusion for the wrong reasons. But however, that set everybody really interested in in this whole thing. Uh, and one of the guys who had been trying to figure out what airplane it was, was a man named Patrick Patsy Judge from Gooseberry. And Patsy was quite a character. I don't know if any of you had ever heard of him, but he, he was a great storyteller. Uh, he played Tin Whistle. His wife, Bridget, uh, was a singer, and they were all, all the local festivals and so. but. Patsy had a, several pieces of the plane in the pond, and he was determined that he was going to find out what, what plane it was. But he didn't have many resources he could call on. So he, he did have some friends in St. John's who were well connected because they had been down hunting and he had been their guide. And so he wrote to one of his contacts, a man named Claude Noonan, worked for Harving Company in St. John's, and said, I was back in the country, I was at the Gulf Pond, and we found these pieces of metal, and I, they were very old. Now, this is 1948. Okay, this is before Confederation. And the, these are very old pieces of metal, and uh, they look like they'd been there for 15 or 20 years. And I'd like you to help me find somebody who can tell me if there are airplanes missing that could explain what, what this is. So Claude Noonan, the contact at St. John's, got the, uh, Patsy's letter to the Bureau of Aviation for, for Newfoundland. And they looked at it, the allegation, and said, well, we have no record of any airplanes going missing in that area in recent years and since we've been in business. So you may be right. It was one of those airplanes that, uh, there were a number of airplanes that disappeared 15 or 20 years ago and it could have been one of those planes. Uh, you might wanna show your pieces of metal to the uh, US Navy people at Argentia because this is 1948, the Naval Air Station was, was there. 
And so apparently Patsy did. He took one of his pieces there and was told, well, we don't know what kind of airplane it came from, but it does seem to be part of an air, uh, airplane undercarriage. Well, the white bird left its undercarriage in, in France. As a matter of fact, the, the undercarriage, the jettison landing gear of the white bird, you can see it today at the Musée de l'Air outside of Paris at, at the French Air Museum. It's one of their treasured exhibits. Okay, so how, how could this thing be undercarriage for the white bird if the white bird didn't have undercarriage? Well, we have a good description. We don't have the piece or a photograph, but we have a good description of this piece Patsy found. And what it sounds like, and we can't be sure, is one of the steel braces on the plywood hull of the airplane to which the undercarriage attached. So yeah, it could be part of the undercarriage. And he found it out on the island. So we've got, okay, apparently pieces of uh, uh, fuel tank out on the rocky island, maybe a piece from the shattered hull, Maybe that airplane, which could land on water and needed calm, sheltered water to land on, somehow managed to hit that island and broke the, the hull, ruptured the fuel tanks, there's an explosion, boom, 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 that Nicholas McGraw hears, and leaves wreckage on the pond that people later see and recover. And so now, I will say that none of those pieces has survived. There are various stories about what became of them. Oh, so-and-so had one that was in his barn, but then his barn burned, and so forth. All right, so there's your puzzle. Uh, no piece has ever been conclusive. We, we found several pieces. Well, we found three pieces of, of, of artifacts there in the pond, and they might be from an airplane crash. They're very old, but none of them is what we call diagnostic of, of being from an airplane. We can't be sure. So the bottom line is no piece has ever been conclusively identified come out of that pond as piece of an airplane at all. Maybe no airplane ever crashed in Gull Pond. We kind of think it did. We all, I don't think these guys were making stuff up. They're not above embellishing the story a little bit. Who isn't? But uh, there was, we, we think there really was a plane, is what's left of a plane in the pond. And we intend to find it. We were out here in the 1990s, and we were trying to find it with remote sensing. We, have, we had electromagnetic sensors mounted in little inflatable, well, we did one on the ice because we could draw grid lines on the ice and do an ac accurate survey. And we did other surveys from inflatable boats. And we were getting these anomalies, these places in the pond where there was an unusual magnetic return, like you would get from a big mass of metal. And we had asked uh, Department of Mines and Energy in St. John's, is, is there anything significant in, in that pond magnetically, uh, uh, s m metallic, like, or that was set off a metal detector? And they said, no, no, there's nothing there. And yet we're getting these signals. And we had thought, yeah, we're, we're finding pieces of the white bird. We came back after the ice melted and we put divers out. And, so, and every time we checked out one of these places, it turned out to be a rock that would set off a metal detector. And so what's going on here? You know, and we couldn't figure it out. We said, oh, well, what we really need is a good magnetic survey of the pond. Find out what's really going on here. But that was really expensive because you'd have to do that from a helicopter, flying back and forth and back and forth. Do you know what they get per hour for a helicopter? <laughs> We do because we're chartering them now, but we, we couldn't afford to do that kind of, of survey. And um, so we said, well, maybe the technology will improve. We'll just have to wait. And that's where it stood until last summer when I get a phone call from 
the people who produce Expedition Unknown for the Discovery Channel, Josh Gates' show. And I'd worked with Josh once before on an Amelia Earhart episode they did. And, uh, but his producers had decided, this, there's this white bird mystery, and, and it sounds like a really good subject for an episode. We need to research it. But every time they researched it, they kept coming up with my name. And so I get this phone call and said, well, we keep running into you on this thing. You apparently know more about this than anybody. Are you planning on doing anything more? I said, well, I'd love to do something more, but I can't afford to do more. We're a little nonprofit. We struggle, just like the folks that support this church struggle. You know, nonprofits, it's about struggle. And they, they said, I said, what I really like is a magnetometer survey. And these days you can do one from a drone. It's a lot cheaper than a helicopter, but it's still really expensive. And they said, well, if we paid for it, would you do it? <laughs> I said, well, twist my arm, guys. Uh, sure. You know, all you've got to do is come up to Newfoundland with us and we'll get a company to do that survey and we'll make an episode about it and you'll be the focus of the show about your work there. I said, well... You know, what's the downside to that? It's great. So I came up last September and we did the episode. And I don't know how many of you have seen the show. Um, it came, I was pleased with the way it came out. And uh, we had a lot of fun doing it because Josh Gates, okay, so he's crazy, but, but he's a lot of fun. And um, we, he and I get along really well. And we, we had a, a good time making this episode, but we, to my astonishment, we actually found a couple things. We're out there at the pond. They've got the film crews. They've got to get pictures of Josh Gates out in the pond doing dangerous stuff. And I've got to be out there with him. And he wanted to do metal detecting with a handheld metal detector around the little rocky island. And I said, Josh, we did this 25 years ago. There's nothing out here. We found one piece here, but we've, we've covered it. No, no, we got to do it. We we got to show people. So we're going to, and to my surprise, and they put it right in the show. I got a hit. I, but it was under the edge of a big rock. And Lisa sitting right there on the island with us, and we said, well, we got to find out what this is. So Josh reached under the rock. The edge was up, and uh, he pulled some grass and mud out little piece of what turned out to be copper wire. I have no idea. The TV show sh says they, we think it's airplane uh, safety wire. We don't know that. It's, it's just copper wire. It may be, but there's no proof of that. But this other thing was this metal disc, about, about like that. And when I f we first pulled it out, we both thought it was probably just the lid of a can or, or something. But when you, you held it, no, it's way too heavy. It's not the lid of any can. And it later turned out, uh, analyze it, it, it had nickel and zinc plating on one surface, kind of dome, it's kind of convex and concave, concave, convex. We still don't have any idea what it was, but it could be airplane wreckage. Okay, so we get the results of the magnetic survey, the drone survey back, and we suddenly understand why we were getting so many false positives back in the 1990s, so many hits that weren't, that were just rocks, because that pond is not quiet like everybody thought it was. It's very active magnetically because of what are called dikes, places in the bedrock where millions of years ago, lava, magma seeped up through and hardened. And any time you have a, a, a streak of that in the base of the pond, it's highly magnetic. And you look at the hits we were getting. Yeah, that's, that's what we were seeing. That's why we were getting that. Okay, so now we understand the pond. We know the environment we're searching. We know what we can't do. We can't search it magnetically because there's too much background noise. We already tried that. It failed. We know why it failed. We can still do it with handheld metal detectors because a handheld metal detector is called a pulse induction metal detector pulses the ground with an electrical signal and tells you when you come across something that conducts electricity better than everything around it. 
But before you start, you calibrate the thing. You put it on the ground and you say, this is what it looks like here magnetically. And then you search for things that are different from that. So that if you have a high background, it senses that. Okay, you got a high background. I'm looking for stuff that's even more than that. So we know we can search it with metal detectors. It's a slow process. You can search visually and Lee will be in the, and Lee and Ernie are, are our divers. They'll be in the water searching visually. Uh, I'll be in the water uh, in one of these heavy immersion suits um, looking at myself. But whether we find anything or not, we'll just see. But uh, that's, that's why we're here. That's what we're doing. Lisa will be there. Uh, we're, we're actually, weather permitting, we're going in tomorrow to collect some data and test some of our systems that we want to use in September for the big search. And uh, Lisa will, will be with us tomorrow, and she'll be with us in September, along with an underwater archaeologist, Ken Keeping. We're working very closely with the province on this, uh, with the rooms, with the uh, provincial archaeology office, and everybody sh should understand that anything in that pond belongs to Newfoundland. Nobody's going to take anything. Now, if it turns out to be the white bird, there's probably going to be a big fight between France <laughs> and, and Ottawa about <laughs> who, who gets this stuff. But that's not our job. Our job is to see what's there and identify if there's anything there. Well, we know there's stuff there, but we need to find whatever is there. Identify it and see if it's the white bird. Because the point, of course, is to solve the mystery, to know what happened. And if in doing that, we can also recover pieces that can be exhibited maybe right beside the landing gear that still exhibits, then, uh, then that's, that's certainly worth doing. Now, before I open this up to questions and comments, this was found stuck in the door of the church here because there was press about me being here tonight. And it's from somebody named Carl D. Kelly, R, R W R N something in St. John's, and there's a phone number. I've never heard of this person, and it's a handwritten uh, copy of a poem that was written here in Newfoundland back then about the French plain. And this has nothing to do with the stories of the plain and the pond. This was just. What, what people, uh, how people here reacted to the disappearance. I had heard that there was such a poem, and some people knew little snippets of it, but nobody had a full copy of it. And suddenly tonight, a full copy shows up, which is just wonderful. The French Flyers, Ninja Saran Coley. In the pages of history are written the names of two men, brave and true, two heroes who fought for their country as only true heroes can do. They fought till the world war was over for their homes and the freedom of men. And the world's highest honor was paid them for they helped to bring that war to an end. But then on a fine summer morning, they climbed in their airship so grand and started to fly o'er the ocean to bring, to bring greater fame to their land. The eyes of the world were upon them as they sailed proudly on through the night. But the thought never came for a moment that this was to be their last flight. A great crowd was waiting to greet them in old New York town far away, where they hoped every moment to greet them, but they waited in vain all the day. And then are the waves flash the message, our brave heroes cannot be found. And great crowds went forth to the rescue, for they knew that the airship was down. There's a lesson to learn from this story. Each life is a ship on its way, and we must be ready to answer 
when the master shall call us someday. And then if there's a note at, the, note at the bottom, wreckage of plane believed to be in pond at the head of Branch River. Jeez. You know, it just showed up here. Another little anecdote. When I went early in the days of this project, and we're way back in the early 1980s, I, um, I got a letter from a woman in Philadelphia with a poem she had written about the white bird's disappearance. And it sort of like this. It's, it's nice stuff. Very, very emotional. But she explained that uh, she had been a 15-year-old girl in 1927 and so taken with this that she wrote this poem. She wanted me to have it because she heard that the organization I had was searching for this plane. And, uh, but she explained who she was. She said, I'm the real James Bond. I said, what? And she said, yeah, uh, Ian Fleming, when he wrote those books, he picked the name jo James Bond from an ornithologist who was in uh, Jamaica. And uh, she was married to the real James Bond. <laughs> but uh, she, she addressed the letter to Captain Gillespie. And I, I corrected her. I said, I'm, I'm not a captain. Yeah. I was lieutenant in the Army, but I was never, I'm not a captain. And she said, no, no, no. Uh, great, great aviators uh, are always captain. So, oh, OK, I'll take that. So th this has been a very rewarding project for me, even though it isn't finished yet, and I do intend to finish it. And uh, I'd like you to help me. So if you have any insights, suggestions, stories, um, observations, I'd love to hear them. Uh, Sir. I have a question. There was uh, supposed to be a 460 horsepower engine in that plane. That's right. That's a big engine. Was, a, it, was it aluminum alloy or steel? It was both. The, the engine was very interesting. It was a Lorraine Dietrich uh, W12. It had 12 cylinders arranged in a W configuration. It's like a V8 with a bank of forward on the middle. And it was liquid cooled. The case was aluminum. And the cylinders were steel in steel water jackets. And there were copper manifolds and stuff. But it was mostly steel, but the, the case was aluminum. And the propeller on that monster was 12 feet long. And um, as a matter of fact, of course, it, it, on takeoff, you know, it sits back on its tail. And then when they get going, it comes up level. When the airplane was level on takeoff, the tip of that propeller was six inches from the ground. So Nunjasir did a great job making that takeoff on a turf runway without hitting the propeller in, in full fuel. So it was, a, it was a great takeoff. But yeah, that, that engine was about four feet square. And, uh, well, you'd think it'd be no trouble to find it. You'd think it'd be no trouble to find it at all, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, I think we know two things about the plane of the pond. I think we either know that there is no plane in the pond or that it's really hard to find. <laughs> and my, I have suspicions about why it's so hard to find. And uh, we're developing the technology we need to solve that problem, and I hope I'm right. It seems to be that uh, I heard the story first in 1959 when I went in bird hunting with Nicholas McGrath's son. He was about 40 years old then, and we walked in towards St. Mary's uh, Sugarloaf, and he said, we got in so far, he said, there's a plane in the pond there, and he told me the story of it. And he, his story was, the plane was flying out through Placentia Bay, and they started to backfire, and Patsy Judge was the guy that see it, and it turned inland, in over Patrice Cove and that area. Yeah, so, yeah. I, and, I, and let me finish now. And he also told me that they found a coat in by the pond. A and what? there was a coat. A coat. With brass buttons on a it. A coat and with brass buttons. And they sewed the brass buttons on another coat because the old coat was rotten. Yeah. And now 
That sounded from Nicholas McGraw's son. Yeah, yeah, Nicholas McGraw's son. Hey, guy, I gotta keep on McGraw Street. What, what was his first name? Patrick. Patrick McGraw. Uh, sorry, oh, Pat, Pat, oh, I, I, I knew Patrick McGraw. I got. That's a picture of me with Patrick McGraw. A long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> it really is me. That's Patrick Judge there. Well, no, the, 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 the picture is, is Patrick Judge. Uh, P Patrick McGraw. I, I never knew Patsy Judge. I wish I did. Uh, yeah. he, he died before we were into this. Yeah, I, I remember Patsy. You remember, remember Patsy? Yes. Yeah. He was a character. He just played pin whistle like that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, okay. The story about the plane coming over Placentia and, and backfiring and turning it, okay. Where that actually comes, what really happened there. So Ninja Sir and Coley disappear, and there's this big fuss about it. And the, uh, there are some very wealthy people down in the States that put up the money. This, we we got to send a search up there. So they, they got an, an Australian pilot named Sidney Cotton, who had done a lot of flying up here in Newfoundland. And they fixed him up. They, they, they bought him an airplane. It was called a Fokker Universal on floats, single engine airplane on floats. And this was June. This is a month after the plane disappeared. And they put that plane on a boat in New York, brought it up here. And, he, and Cotton was based in Placentia and, and did an aerial search for the white bird around Newfoundland in his Fokker Universal. And so, and that, that engine backfired a lot. And, and so, yes, there was a plane. That, it, it happened a month later and it wasn't the white bird, but that's how these stories get going. Uh, meanwhile, he told me about playing the wing in the pond. The, oh, wait a minute, wait. <coughs> the wing in the pond? He said that his father used to be in the ratting, they called us, uh, looking for muskrat right. in, the, in the winter time. And, and, that would uh, be Nicholas, yeah. He, he come up, he said there was the wing of a plane was sticking out of the pond. And this was probably around 1928, 29, 30, yeah. frame yeah, around yeah. there. That's, yeah. That's the story. Now, th this is all secondhand that this guy told me. It always me. is. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's great. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't get your name. George Lannan. George Lannan. Lannan? Yeah. Can you spell your last name for us? Spell your last name? L-A-N-N-O-N. Lannan. Okay, George Lannan. Yeah. It is a pleasure to meet you, George. How you doing? Thank you. Oh, uh, that's that's great. That's yeah, great. Th that plane that was here looking for them yeah. in 1927. Yeah. She, she was here in the summer of 1927. It was a float plane, it was. Yes. And they used to land up in the southeast arm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody went down to look at it, and they made a big joke at it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. That's, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, so God. Where, where would that float plane come from? Well, a, a float plane? Yeah, or who was paying for the Oh, this was the Guggenheim Foundation in, uh, in New York. Uh, big aviation uh, promoting aeronautics. And there was a DuPont involved in the funding of it, too. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Rick, there's a news article that was sent to me this evening. Uh, uh, there's many people that are interested and wanted to come here tonight, but couldn't. Danny Lennon actually sent this to me this evening. Uh, he, he's very much into research and we share information. He sent that along about Mr. Cotton yeah. and his flying plane. So that's an article on that. Yeah. The poem that you read, Yes. Uh, I, I meant to print it off and send it in as well. Uh, I'll just show you that and I'll just get the name. So the whole thing is correct, same as what I have here. Um, um, Mrs. from Branch, grew up in Branch, her family is from Branch. Uh, she told me it was a song that her mom used to sing. A song? Yeah. And oh. uh, it's the exact same poem, word for word. But at the end of this piece, she said it was recorded by Vernon Dalhurst. 
um, and the, there's a note to it, so the two French flyers, whose name is recorded on the pages of history, but apparently nowhere else were Coley and Nungasser non, non were mentioned. But she grew up uh, listening to that, and she sings it herself. I she said, I sings think, it herself? She sings oh, it herself. Oh, I would I love said, to she, know what the she two... She wanted to come out here tonight, oh. and I said, I'm going to... She said, I'll sing it for you sometime. I said, I'm going to take you up on that offer. Please do. Uh, Record it. I'll get that for you. Oh, God. Uh, Thank that's you. That's that one. And there's another article. I don't know if you have that or not. But, yeah, I wrote it. Uh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> someone, someone sent that to me as well. So there you go. There was no, uh, no yeah. name on it. But also you mentioned Patsy Judge. Yes. Okay, well, he's, he was well known on the Cape Shore. Yeah. Friends with my husband's family and stuff like that. Uh, Patsy Judge, uh, he had a son, Jimmy Joe. Um, James, well, Jimmy Joe. Well, the, no, not Doyle. There was Jim Joe Doyle, but no, that. Patsy Joe had a son, Jimmy Joe. Okay, that that's 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 prob that probably why he named him. But because my understanding is that James Joseph Doyle, he uh, daughter Bridget was orphaned and adopted by Jim Joe Doyle, and then Patsy married Bridget. And so that oh, maybe he was a doctor. I don't know that part, but I know uh, we always call him Jimmy Joe. <coughs> yeah, okay, right? fine. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's Jimmy Joe's wife is still alive, Madonna. So she, I don't know if you've ever spoken no, to her. No, no, no. So I'm sure she grew up and around the kitchen table. And oh, the yeah. Too, would have heard many a story. I tried to get in touch with her to get her here tonight. I wasn't able to do it because she's always on the go. But I can certainly put you in touch with her. Yeah, well. let's let's do that. Okay. Yeah. We're not done with this. No, thank God. <laughs> yeah. oh, this is th that's something I, I I love about this project, is this connection to these people. Absolutely. They're such a unique and lovely group. I just so um, gosh, where are, who else knows something really cool? <laughs> Maybe some, an artifact sitting on a. Yeah, we, we we always dream of somebody showing up at something like this. Yeah, you know, my great uncle had this kicking around for a long time and always said it was, but we we always thought it was nonsense. But here, you know, wow. Nah, we're never that lucky. But uh, so the artifact in the rooms. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit more about that? Oh, okay. The artifacts in the rooms. The 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 thing I found in 1992 just off the southern tip of the island. Find it with a metal detector. And it was buried in the mud. It was out in the water, but not far. And I reached down and I could feel there was something hard. It was a beep, beep, beep. I reached down, something hard, and I pulled it out of the mud. And it was like about that, that long and about that big around. It was like half a cylinder with very jagged edges. And obviously been there for a long time, very rusted, very, and it looked like a cylinder that had been blown apart. But I don't know that it was blown apart. It, it could be that it was an, a cylinder that laid there and only half of it was buried in the mud and the part that didn't get buried in the mud rusted away. I, I don't know, I have no way of knowing. But one thing I did notice is when I picked it up and I'm brushing it off, the inside of the cylinder left like an oily residue, like oil, it smelled like oil. I'm, and I said, okay, this was part of some machine. It's part of an airplane? It's, it's too small to be a, an engine cylinder from that engine. But there could be other things that, or it could be from some other machine that, but I don't know what kind of, it's way too old to be like a snowmobile or ATV way too old. <coughs> but now we're talking archaeology, and that's Lisa's department. And she's been able to escape. So, oh, you, she's got a picture of it. I did bring pictures, so, you know, we, we didn't bother with the big screen, because Rick figured he'd keep you all captivated. But I did bring pictures, so, and you can come up and look at this after. But this is the one that they found in the 90s, the cylinder he was just talking about. Um, and there's a scale there, so it's not huge, but you know, it's, it's pretty big. Scale here is for just a couple of centimeters, so you're looking at a fairly sizable piece. So that's outside, inside of it. Uh, and anyone has any knee-jerk reaction, oh my god, that looks like, you know, say it. 
because <laughs> we don't know what it is. Um, the other piece, what was found there with the Discovery Channel show, we have the, 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 the round piece that he was talking about. It is thicker than something like a can lid. There doesn't seem to be, it, it doesn't look like it just sort of popped off or something. So it might have been potentially, uh, Rick did theorize that it might even be about the same shape as this piece, so maybe it did actually fit in that. But, because this piece is fairly rusted, it's really hard to tell, but they're, they're all a little bit bent up, so it's kind of hard to know what's what. This is currently in conservation, so here it's really wet looking, and that's because we found it in water, so we had to keep it in water, and hopefully in the next couple of months it will be out of conservation, and we can get clearer pictures of it and do, take better pictures, <coughs> have a better idea. So yeah, you can see how it's really there, how it's bent up. So what caused that? Not sure. Uh, the other piece is just a small coil of copper wire. Um, I get a funny feeling this was, snare. it's a little too thick for that, but there was a copper slot on the island probably holding that up over fire. <laughs> so, but not sure again, but it's too thick to be something like a snare. It's okay. um, a heavier gauge copper than what you use for a snare, which I did have to find out because I'm totally Italian <laughs> and have never snared anything. Um, but yeah, there's a bigger piece, a bigger picture. It's only about four centimeters, but you can see how thick that copper is. So maybe it was tying something on somewhere, yeah. you know? but it's really hard to know because even doing the analysis of the content of it, the metal content, all it says is copper. So it doesn't really tell us, you know, where that copper, you could get really in depth and try and source where copper came from. That's something that gets done with ancient copper, but it's really hard to do for modern copper because usually it's just copper. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is it something else we're going to be doing? Uh, it turns out it turns out that the sediment in ponds will give you a history of the pond because it changes over time. And there is a whole laboratory at Memorial University that's called the uh, eco uh, ecoecology lab. And they take core samples of sediment from ponds all over the province and they examine them and they do radioisotope analysis, they're just amazing stuff. And most of the time they're looking for evidence of uh, indigenous people in the past, like charcoal from fires and that like. But I was talking to the head of the laboratory about this and she said, well, we can take a core sample of sediment from that pond and look for evidence of an unusual event 95 years ago. Because if an airplane crashed in that pond, there could be a high level of lead from the lead in the gasoline. There could be charcoal from an explosion and fire. There could be tiny bits of linen because that airplane was covered with wood framing and it was probably Irish linen, which is with dope, really tough stuff. Uh, you were talking about a, a jacket with bra brass buttons. Yes. Okay. This is, I've, I've got a few copies of this magazine that we put out here for people. Real, I wish I was able to bring more. That's the way they were, they were dressed. You, you can have this. Um, leather flying suits, very heavy zippered. Remember, these guys are going to be sitting in an open cockpit over the North Atlantic for 40 hours, unheated. So they were dressed up pretty warm. But these leather flying suits, waterproof, they could still be there. We, we have uh, one of our researchers is a professor of uh, medicine at a university in Minnesota. And he's been looking into this and talking to people who know about body survival and water and that. And uh, it's certainly possible that 
human remains are somewhere in that pond, and probably buried in sediment. That would be an amazing find. Uh, we can't say that it's likely, but it's certainly possible. So. You, you go to the ponds on the Avalon, they're uh, peat bog yeah. area. So what gets washed in is usually pretty peat boggy, so you get a big layer of that. Yeah. So how big is the pond you're talking about? It, the, the section of the pond in question is about a quarter mile by a half a mile. Yeah. It, it doesn't sound like much until you get out there trying to find stuff. <laughs> and how deep is the water? Maybe? It's only about seven feet deep in the deepest parts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and a, a lot of it's a lot of it's very shallow, rocky along the shorelines and around the island. And those rocks are almost impossible to walk on. They're slimy and and yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's quite a challenge but we're doing what we can. Yeah. Questions? Comments? Suppose the uh, lower pond you ever checked, there's a pond just below that runs out, not too far from that island. Has that ever been... Uh, uh, other ponds? No, the p same pond, on that pond. Yeah, the yeah, there are like two sections. Yes. There, there are the sections. Uh, not much, no. no. Because because the all the river runs out and runs down into this pond too, with any debris, might have flowed yeah, down. Well, oh, 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 the pond, okay. Then There's, then the, yes, I have, I, I have looked in that pond. As a matter of fact, God, when was it? 94, I think. We were looking at old, old aerial photos, and there are photos of those ponds that go back to the late 1930s, and we saw something in that pond, an object of some kind. So, well, there's certainly nothing visible there now, uh, but maybe they, and so I checked that pond with a metal detector. We did it in December when there was that much ice on it, and I was out there stomping around in an emergency suit. And, yeah, we checked the pond. <laughs> the, what we, we figure, we, we did see evidence that there had once been a, a beaver dam there, and that was probably a beaver lodge we were looking at in the old photographs. But yeah, that, that, that's a good thought, yeah. And now there were accounts of people finding pieces of wood, um, sometimes described as canvas on wood framing. And one person even said he found a piece of wood framing with canvas on it, it was so big he couldn't pick it up. And, but that was down the Branch River. And I think it was Anthony McGraw, found uh, some pieces of wood with aluminum riveted, uh, attached to it somehow, but, but sheared off like, like in an explosion. And, uh, but those are, and anything buoyant could very well, when the ice goes out in the winter and then it goes down the, down the river. Nothing like that is likely to have survived. The, the, the stuff that is likely to, most likely to survive is anything that got buried in the silt in an oxygen-free environment. You get something in that environment, and as, as Ken, our underwater archaeologist, said, it'll last forever. Mm. And stuff like that. Ma'am? Okay. Is there a difference in decomposition of a vehicle or, a, or an iron or a, a, a vehicle? made of things that have iron in them in salt water versus fresh water. Yeah, oh sure. Um, Lisa, that's a question you can answer best. Yeah, uh, salt water will definitely eat through iron faster. I mean, look at our cars with the salt on the road. So well, I just wonder because the Titanic is still there. It is, but, but that is... We can find evidence of this plate. <laughs> yeah, but the Titanic is really low. So you're, you guess it's salt water, but you're not getting as much bacteria activity in that area. And when you don't have as much oxygen mixing as well, then you don't have as much uh, possibility for things to rust out. Um, when it comes to something in a pond or in a bog or anything like that, where we've got the water going up and down constantly with the seasons, 
If it dries out too much, everything's going to be exposed. The air gets at it. It'll get eaten away at quickly. The water comes back. It's a different environment, so it impacts it again. Water goes down, eats away at it. That first artifact that I showed was really rusted out because it wasn't kept in water immediately. We have learned a lot about metal conservation in the past handful of years. So now what we do is if we find something in water, you keep it in water. Uh, Ken, who is going to be coming out in the fall, he works with the uh, Shipwreck Preservation Society. And they go around and they map a lot of the shipwrecks around Newfoundland and take underwater pictures and try to identify some of them. And a big thing is they don't actually collect anything from these because it is hugely expensive to try and preserve something that has been in either fresh water or salt water. Um, so trying to do something like a big shipwreck, we don't have budgets for that. Uh, <laughs> but we can go out and record such things. Plus, Newfoundland is a very acidic environment. So just our, our rain, the environment itself, there's, there's a lot of just natural acid. And that is very poor for metals as well. Uh, so that's why, even without the salt on the roads, our cars would rust out pretty quick just because of the environment. So the same goes for any sort of metal that's in any environment in Newfoundland. So that does kind of come into play. Uh, things like linens, uh, natural fibers, hair, you know, cottons, preserve really, really well in our environment. Metals, not so much. So the planes that we're talking about in 1927 would have been mostly made of wood and yeah. fibers. Yeah. So, so they would be more able to sustain the environment there. In theory, if it was buried. And if it didn't uh, burn up in the first place in an explosion. Well, that too. Yeah. But like we've got wood and fabric from Fairyland from the 1600s. Now this was all stuff found in the privy. Uh, so it wasn't getting the yeah, I know. <laughs> I've never had to work on those ones, but I've walked by when other people are working on it and you can smell it came out of the toilet. But <laughs> because of that environment, because everything would sort of be packed in, we know what people were wearing in the 1600s because we have good preservation naturally in Newfoundland for things like fabrics and woods. So it's so, kind of a fingers crossed thing. Hopefully, hopefully the environment is right to preserve something, but it's always hard to know. So be careful what you flushed on the toilet because you could be driving some archaeologist 200 years from now crazy. Yeah. <laughs>